Welcome to the recall session of the Microbiology MCQs of the NEET 2021. After a long hiatus, it's nice to be back discussing these questions. And kudos to all of you for surviving through these trying times of the repeated postponement of the NEET exam. Now, before I come to the discussion, I would just like to say a disclaimer that these questions are all recall based. And I have tried to put the whole question, put all the options before I recorded this video. That is the reason for the slight delay by a couple of days in recording these sessions, because we wanted to have a complete question, complete with the options, then only, you know, uh, come up for the discussion. Now, let's have a look at the uh, distribution of the questions. First of all, Let's start with bacteriology. We had five questions from there. Culture medium, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Pseudomonas, and Yersinia. These were asked. Then parasites, Strongyloides, Leishmania, as, and uh, filarial nematodes were asked. Amongst viruses, measles and varicella zoster. Amongst fungi, we got two questions on dermatophytes. In immunology, we just got a question on antigen-antibody reactions. And in general microbiology, we had one question each from microscopes and sterilization and disinfection. Now, a couple of these questions are overlapping with, uh, with other subjects. So I may not be discussing them, but they will be discussed by the respective faculties. It could be dermatology or it could be PSM or it could be gyneos. Okay. Now, coming to the types of questions which are asked in microbiology, we got all clinical case-based questions. There was always a patient and all, and we were given a situation and asked the question. In most of the question, the final, you know, we, the diagnosis was pretty easy and you had to directly answer the question. But in two of them or three of them, we had to arrive at the diagnosis by putting the symptoms together and then, you know, arrive at the answer. So three of them were slightly tricky, but most of them were direct questions. Of course, most all of them were case-based. So let's get started. An unimmunized two-year-old child presents with coryza, conjunctivitis, and bluish spots in the oral mucosa near the lower molar teeth. A day later, a maculopapular rash appeared on the face and the neck. What is the nature of the causative virus? Naked, single-stranded RNA, enveloped single-stranded RNA, naked double-stranded RNA, and enveloped double-stranded DNA. So the answer to this question is enveloped single-stranded RNA virus. Now, how did we arrive at this answer? Putting the symptoms together in the question, coryza, conjunctivitis, with bluish spots in the oral mucosa near the lower molar tip, teeth, what are these? These are the coplic spots. So all of them are hinting to the diagnosis of measles, which are seen, these symptoms are seen in the prodromal stage. Okay, and after the uh, two to three days of the prodrome, the patient is going to come with a typical maculopapular rash, which starts from the ear, the forehead, and then gradually spreads to the rest of the body, right? So these are the first three signs of measles, the three Cs, cuff, coryza, and conjunctivitis seen in the prodrome, which may be associated also with complex spots, okay? So what are, so our di diagnosis is measles, and measles belongs to the paramyxoviruses. And paramyxoviruses are single-stranded RNA viruses, which are enveloped, okay? So that's our answer, enveloped single-stranded RNA. Complex spots, the word complex contains the letter L. So remember, they are more seen mostly in the against the lower molar teeth. Okay. Small ulcerations. Okay. So what is their characteristic? They are pathognomonic of measles. They are seen in the prodromal phase. They disappear once the rash appears and they are bluish white ulcerations mostly seen against in the against the lower first and second molars. Now, paramyxoviruses. These are enveloped and they have a helical symmetry. Their genome is single-stranded RNA and it is unsegmented. The, the other myxovirus, that is orthomyxoviruses, these are 
this contains influenza they are closely related but they have a segmented genome seven or eight segments are present in that genome but paramyxoviruses these have unsegmented single stranded rna genome which is negative sense it is a negative sense negative sense meaning that single stranded rna can not directly be translated by the ribosomes they first the single strand has to be converted into a positive sense and then this can be translated into the proteins in the host cell right we'll see that just now so what are the important members here in paramyxoviridae measles also called as rubella mumps para influenza respiratory syncytial virus and newer additions in the last few years are meta pneumoviruses and the zoonotic para myxoviruses nipa virus and hendra virus remember nipa very important for us that's a para myxoviruses now let us see how do uh, these rna viruses positive and single stranded replicate in the host cell now this is a positive single stranded rna let's consider this is sars cov2 because that's very relevant for us nowadays so here the genome when it is released into the host cell it is ribosome ready that positive sense rna is ribosome ready it can be directly translated into proteins some of them are going to be the enzymes which are going to help the virus in the replication in further replication in the host cell one of these is going to be a rna dependent rna polymerase and using that enzyme from that positive sense rna a negative sense rna is going to be synthesized and this is going to be used as a template for the synthesis of several copies of the positive single stranded rna these are going to be assembled with the proteins the structural proteins and then the virus is going to be released from the host cell so positive single stranded rna viruses are ribosome ready now coming to negative single stranded rna viruses as we just talked about para myxoviruses ortho myxoviruses here what is the problem is this negative sense rna cannot be directly translated so we need to synthesize the moment this is uncoated in the host cell the genome it has to generate a positive single stranded rna which can then be translated into the early proteins the enzymes as well as the structural proteins so for that it has to get a rna dependent rna polymerase along with it it should be a component of the virus itself so that it can generate that positive single strand sense rna and then this is going to be translated into the proteins and if there multiple copies of negative sense rna is going to be synthesized and these are going to be assembled followed by the release of the virus from the host cell so that means always negative sense rna viruses have to have their rna dependent rna polymerase in the virus itself they cannot utilize the host cell to you know of course we don't have the normal mammalian host cells do not have these rna dependent rna for rna polymerase okay so they have to get this enzyme so for using for remembering the negative sense rna viruses we are going to use this mnemonic always bring the polymerase or fail replication if you don't get that rna dependent rna polymerase you are not going to be replicating in this host cell so what are these arena viruses bunya viruses delta viruses para myxoviruses ortho myxoviruses filo viruses and rapto viruses okay so our answer to that question was enveloped single stranded rna viruses for measles we move on to our next question a group of 20 friends had a late night party at a restaurant two of them stopped back to eat pastry from a roadside vendor only those who ate pastry manifested with nausea and vomiting early next morning which of the following is the likely etiology enterotoxin of staphylococcus bacillus cereus emetic toxin shiga toxin and virotoxin of escherichia coli shiga toxin 
of Shigella dysentery. That would be uh, possibly that might have been written in the question. Okay. Now, what is going to help us arrive at the answer are these important clinching uh, keys out there. First, late night it is mentioned. Okay. So that would be somewhere around 11 or 12 o'clock, maybe 1030 or so. And what is the food implicated? Pastry. And these people are people who have eaten pastry have developed nausea and vomiting early next morning. What is this trying to tell us that this is a short incubation food poisoning early would be somewhere around six or seven o'clock. OK, so that means our diagnosis should be short incubation food poisoning. And what are the two causes of short incubation food poisoning? One is Staphylococcus aureus and the other one is Bacillus serious and the answer to this question is staphylococcus okay i'll tell you why bacillus serious is not the answer for the other two shiga toxin and virotoxin of escherichia coli the incubation period is much longer at least 48 hours is required for shigella that's the minimum two days and for virotoxin at least three days is the incubation period Right. So let's quickly go through the important points of Staphylococcus aureus food poisoning. So what is the, the history behind it that there is a carrier maybe in the nose or on the skin. Right. And this Staph aureus carrier without washing his hands handles some food products like dairy or meat products. We'll find out which other one. These specifically mentioned the questions later. Now. This food is inappropriately stored. So it is stored at room temperature, not refrigerator, refri not refrigerated after contamination. And so Staph aureus produces these toxins in the food. These are preformed toxins and these are heat stable. So even if the food is heated before it is ingested, the toxins are still intact. They are not denatured on heating. And what do they act on? They basically act on the autonomic nervous system. And they have an incubation period generally mentioned as one to six hours, maybe sometimes may extend by a couple of hours. And the predominant symptoms are nausea and vomiting, sometimes associated with watery diarrhea. And this is a self-limited food poisoning. Within six to 12 hours, there is spontaneous resolution. Okay, And obviously, because it is a toxin-mediated illness, right? Antibiotics are not required, okay, because these are probably destroyed by that process of heating the bacterium, but the toxins are the ones which are the culprits here. So only symptomatic treatment is required, just fluids to be given, antiemetics to be given, and the patient is going to be fine. So coming to what are the implicated foods, meats like sausages, ham, salads, very important. Many times it is written as egg salad or potato salad in recent times couple of years back it was potato salad or as was seen in these questions bakery products like pastries cream pies and eclairs and milk products sometimes cheeses and so on okay so coming to why is bacillus serious not the answer why not bacillus serious because bacillus serious we know it produces two types of disease one the Diarrheal type, that has an incubation period, which is generally 8 to 16 hours. Here, there, the implicated food is meat products. And emetic type, which has a short incubation food poisoning, there, the implicated food is Chinese or fried rice. So that is the reason it is not the answer. The implicated food is telling us the answer is not bacillus cereus. It is Staphylococcus aureus enterotoxins. Okay. So let's move on to our third question. A patient was admitted with 50% of burns who de develops an infection at the burn site. The swab is cultured and the isolate is a strict aerobe and the test shown in the figure was positive. Which of the following is the likely etiology of the burn infection? Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Escherichia coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Salmonella. Now, this is question is put asking you or telling you three things out here. One, it's a burn infection. Second, the organism is a strict aerobe, and it is oxidase test positive. 
Okay, this is the oxidase test. There is a, a filter paper strip on which a certain chemical, which is a, which has a very long name, tetramethyl paraphenylene diamine dihydrochloride. This is impregnated on that filter paper strip. We just with the using a wooden stick. We just have to pick up the colony of the bacterium, apply it on that filter paper strip, and if you see a color change, that is telling you this bacterium is oxidase positive. Okay. So putting these three hints together, a burn infection, strict aerobe and oxidase test positive, my answer is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay. So oxidase test, very important to remember. In fact, I tell all students that catalase and oxidase test, urease test and how a bacterium utilizes sugars fermentatively, oxidatively, or it is asaccharidic is very, very important to remember because if you know that these kinds of questions are cakewalk for all of you. So remember that most bacteria are oxidase test positive. In fact, this picture is, this image is part of my videos in marrow lectures. Okay. And oxidase, so oxidase, most bacteria are oxidase positive. So an easy way to remember is remember the exceptions. The oxidase negative bacteria are, you can use this mnemonic, CESS, Corine bacterium, the big family of Enterobacteriaceae, Staphylococcus and Streptococci. These are oxidase negative. So all the other bacteria, whatever you may think of, Pseudomonas, Burkholderia, Haemophilus, or Brucella, Bordetella, Campylobacter, Helicobacter, you name them and they will all be oxidase test positive, right? So the easy ways, remember the exceptions, the rest bacteria will be oxidase positive. Okay. And another thing that was mentioned, the question is the fact that they are strict aerobes. Now, how are you going to remember the strict aerobes? By this mnemonic, nagging pests must breathe for life. So, nocardia, pseudomonas, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Micrococcus, Brucella and Bordetella, Francisella and Legionella. The first letters of this, this these words. So Pseudomonas is a strict aerobia, right? And that means our answer, which was pretty easy. Burn infection, the first or first two organisms we're going to think of is Staphylococcus aureus or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Anyway. Right. So it was pretty easy question coming to why are the other options not the answer? Because all these Escherichia coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Salmonella, they're all members of the family Enterobacteriaceae. So all Enterobacteriaceae we know are oxidase test negative. Very important to remember all Enterobacteriaceae are oxidase test negative so that easily is going to help us rule out the answer and anyway all enterobacteria are also facultative anaerobes so they will obviously our answer by elimination will come to pseudomonas aeruginosa okay so we have very smart invigilators or exam setters nowadays instead of saying directly that this organism is oxidase positive or oxidase negative they are showing us images of these tests and they are trying our knowledge from every nook and corner. Okay, our next question. A th three-year-old child with loose stools, fever and blood in the stools. Which of the following enrichment medium should be used to isolate the organism from the stool sample? From the stool sample, right? So we have a child who has come with bloody diarrhea along with fever. So our diagnosis is pretty easy. It is a it is an invasive diarrhea. Presence of blood and mucus along with fever generally tells us it's an invasive cause of diarrhea. And obviously, we're going to immediately think of what organisms, organisms which are causes of invasive diarrheas are Shigella, especially in India. The most common cause of bloody diarrhea is going to be Shigella. Others include Campylobacter, the non-typhoidal Salmonellas like Enteritis, Salmonella, Typhi, Murium, etc. And Shiga toxigenic Escherichia coli. Also, we know it as Entero 
hemorrhagic E. coli. But here, though it is an invasive diarrhea, it's important to remember that it is generally without fever, right? So in, let's go back to our question here. And obviously, so what are we going to think of? We are going to look for these invasive, uh, um, uh, the enrichment medium for these invasive diarrheas. And out of these, answer here would be selenite F, okay? Can we just go through the important points we're going to remember about the enrichment medium? What is an enrichment medium? It's a medium that inhibits unwanted bacteria. So it just select, select, it just selects out certain bacterial growth. Only you are allowed to grow. And second criteria is it should be liquid in consistency. Okay, Because if it is solid in consistency, what do we call such a medium? It is called as a selective medium. Okay. So solid, selective, if it is liquid, that means it's going to be called as an enrichment medium. And the important enrichment media here are enrichment medium for Vibrio is alkaline peptone water and monsoon's broth. Enrichment medium for Salmonella is gram negative broth, selenite F broth and tetrathionate broth. And enrichment medium for Shigella is gram negative broth and selenite F broth. And for both these, the these are common, selenite F was the answer. So it could be non-typhoidal salmonellas or it could be shigella as the likely cause of that invasive diarrhea in the child. Our answer is going to be this. Obviously, alkaline peptone water, which was option number A, would obviously not be the answer. Why? Because here, this is a selective med enrichment medium for Vibrios. Okay. Alkal and Vibrio is not going to be associated with bloody diarrhea, which is typically associated with watery diarrhea. Okay, so now let's move on to our next question. A case of tinea capitis was uh, mentioned. White powdery colonies were isolated from the hair specimen. The hair perforation test was positive on the isolate. Which of the following is the likely etiology? Okay, so here. What is the diagnosis? Tinea capitis due to a dermatophyte which is giving the hair perforation test positive. Our answer is going to be tinea, uh, trichophyton mentagrophytes. Okay, So just remember that hair perforation test is a test which is done once we have isolated the fungus from the specimen. So once we've cultured the a uh, hair clipping, a hair specimen on the sabrods dextrose agar and five to seven days later when we got the colonies, we're going to take a sterile hair, an uninfected hair. It could be an animal hair or it could be human hair and we're going to autoclave it at 121 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes, meaning we are going to sterilize it. And now once we've got the colony of the fungus, we are going to take an empty Petri plate with the hair specimen and apply the colony onto the hair with a little few drops of water in that petri plate and close the petri plate for a few days. And after a few days, we're going to prepare a lactophenol cotton blue mound and observe that hair under the microscope. And if you see these kinds of wedge shaped perforations, that means the hair perforation test is positive. And amongst all the dermatophytes which cause disease in humans, the ones which give the hair perforation test positive are just two. So very easy to remember, trichophyton mentagrophytes and the other one is microsporum canis. Here, so this is pretty straightforward question. Hair perforation test is positive for which of the following dermatophytes. Okay. Right. So dermatophytes, the ones which cause disease in humans are belonging to the following genera, trichophyton. And how do we identify trichophyton? When we prepare a lactophenol cotton blue mount of the colony, what are we seeing? We are seeing these pencil-shaped macroconidia, these big widths. So we can get two sized conidias, big ones, macro, small ones, microconidia. And we see few macroconidia which are pencil-shaped and plenty of the small ones, the microconidias. Okay. The second one is epidermophyton. And here, what do we see? We see these club-shaped macroconidia and we see no microconidia. So lots of macroconidia are seen, 
and no microconidia are seen. Many times we are given this kind of question directly. We are uh, asked which of the following is the causative agent of such and such dermatophytosis. So these kinds of properties are mentioned, the presence of macro and microconidia. Coming to the third genus, microsporum, this produces spindle-shaped or boat-shaped or fusiform-shaped macroconidia. And these are many in number and they produce few microconidia, few microconidia. Okay. So we got also one more question which will be taken up in more detail by our dermatology faculty, Dr. Malcolm. But I'm just telling you, yes. We got a question, an image-based question also on Kirion. This was a child who has come with a swelling, uh, with loss of hair on the scalp. Along with that, there was this kind of a picture with lots of pus points. So the diagnosis here was, uh, it was just directly asked what kind, whether it is folliculitis or it is epidermal cyst or it is Kirion. So the diagnosis here was Kirion. And what are the causes of Kirion? Trichophyton, of course, in the history, what was clinching the diagnosis of Kirion was the fact that there was a pet dog of that child. Pet dog telling us this is a zoophilic dermatophyte. So Kirion is caused by these two important zoophilic dermatophytes, trichophyton verucosum and trichophyton mentagrophytes. Okay. Next question. This is a patient on steroids for chronic urticaria for two years. Now he has presented to the emergency with acute worsening of respiratory symptoms. He says that he has been having nocturnal cough for the last several weeks. Hemogram is showing us marked eosinophilia. Bronchoscopy was done and the bowel was collected. Microscopy of the bowel showed small larval forms. Most likely cause of these symptoms is capillaria philippensis, ankylostoma caninum, strongyloides turcoralis, and enterobius vermicularis. Okay, now what is important here to register is this is a patient on long-term steroids for two years. He's been. So that means it is indicating an immunosuppressed stage in this state in this patient with some respiratory symptoms and eosinophilia that is mostly seen in all parasitic infections. And bowel is showing these small larval stages. When we think of, uh, you know, respiratory secretions like bowel or sputum showing larval stages, what are the organisms we start to think about? Those nematodes, of course, larval stages would be seen of nematodes only. Those nematodes which are passing through the lungs, which are those? The hookworms. Then we have ascaris. And we have strongyloides. That is our answer to this question. None of the hookworms are mentioned in the question. Ankylostoma caninum is not a human hookworm. This is a dog hookworm and it causes a totally different disease in humans. It has no passage in the lung. So even if you knew larval stages passing through the lungs, hookworms, ascaris and strongyloides, you can easily arrive at the answer, though you may not know anything about capillaria philippensis. Because generally we do not teach this. It's a very, very rare disease, in, especially in India, mainly reported from countries around the Philippines, in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Thailand, and so on. Okay, So generally we don't talk about this organism. But yes, enterobius is so simple to eliminate. It has no passage through the lungs. And chylostoma caninum causes cutaneous larva migrants. So by our answer here is strongyloides. And whenever you have a patient on steroids or immunosuppressants for transplantation and so on, think of strongyloides. It causes opportunistic infections in them, auto-infections, hyper-infection, disseminated strongyloidiasis is so typical of this disinfection in immunosuppressants. Okay, so that's our Strongyloidus life cycle. Mode of infection is the pilary form larva penetrating the skin when we walk through soil, barefoot through soil containing these pilary form larva. Then they're going to enter the blood and reach the right side of the heart, have a passage through the lungs, break through the alveoli, climb the trachea, and finally are swallowed to reach the small intestines where they are going to develop into 
adult worms. Adult females are parthenogenic. They don't need the males for laying the eggs. They say we can manage without you males. We are boss, boss ladies. So we don't need the help of males for laying the eggs. And what is strongyloid is it is an ovoviviparous nematode. It the, directly the moment the egg is laid, it is going to hatch into rapidity form larvae. And these larval forms are what are seen in the patient's stool sample. So generally, that is how we diagnose strongyloidiasis. Take the stool sample and demonstrate these rapidity form larva in various step by using various techniques like the Bearman funnel technique, the Harada Mori filter paper technique, or the agar plate culture technique. And these rapidity form larva can they directly develop into adult worms which are free living in soil, which are going to mate, and the female is going to lay the eggs. Rapidity form larva is going to hatch immediately to give rise to the infective form for humans, the filary form larvae. Okay, and sometimes the rapidity form larva directly develop into the filary form larva, which then infect the humans. Now, one important point here is that in immunodeficient patient, these rapidity form larvae can develop into filary form larva within the GI tract, and that is called these filary form larva will penetrate the intestinal mucosa and they will cause autoinfection. In fact, it, I would call it internal auto infection and this can this uh, can lead to hyper infection lots of larvae circulating in the body plus disseminated strongyloidiasis okay so strongyloidis i would always say that's a most important pattern in helminth to, that is very very often asked in aims exam now it has been asked in i and i uh, neat exam also okay Right, so that the press while they are passing through the lungs, that's the time that they can be demonstrable in the sputum specimen. Okay, coming to why is capillaria filipensis not the answer to this question is because this is causing a disease which is just restricted to the intestines of the humans. It is acquired by ingestion of poorly cooked fishes which are containing some infective larvae, they would develop into adult worms in the small intestines and the female lays eggs which are embryonated and unembryonated. And the embryonated ones can cause auto-infection, internal auto-infection. But here the disease is just restricted to the intestines. There is no passage through the lungs. And that internal auto-infection can sometimes lead to so lots of Adult worms in the intestines itself, they can cause a protein losing enteropathy, which can sometimes lead to cardiomyopathy, cachexia, as well as death. So we just remember capillaria filipensis at two important points. One, it's a helminth which is acquired by ingestion of poorly cooked fish, but it is mainly reported from Southeast Asian countries, as I said earlier, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, and so on. And important, another thing is that it is associated with auto-infection. As you all must be remembering that we use this mnemonic to remember the uh, helminths associated, rather parasites associated with auto-infection. C-C-H-E-S-T, chest. So that capillaria filipensis, cryptosporidium parvum are the C's. Hymenolepis nana, Enterobius vermicularis, Strongyloidis turcoralis, and Tinea solium. Auto infection is seen in these. Okay, then we had another option, Ankylostoma caninum, in this. Now, many students made the blunder of thinking, thinking that this is a hookworm. Guys and girls, you have to keep your senses, remain composed and calm in the uh, exam hall. Please don't lose it. Don't become so overconfident and be in a hurry to answer your questions here. Ankylostoma caninum is what is mentioned, not ankylostoma duodenale. Yes, that duodenale would have a passage through the lungs. But here, this is a dog hookworm. And what do dog hookworms cause? They cause cutaneous larva migrants like ankylostoma brasiliensis, bunostomium, uncinaria. These are causes of cutaneous larva migrants. Here what happens is the filary form larva penetrates the skin of humans. But 
it cannot pass through the skin completely to enter the blood vessels so it just keeps on migrating in the human skin and they we see serpiginous eruptions in the human skin like these so okay so many times this question is asked it's an image based question and the patient has worked in a dog kennel or he has cleaned the dog kennel think of cutaneous larva migrants being caused by brasiliensis or ankylostoma canina okay so that eliminates our this option and lastly of course enterobius vermicularis it has the most simple life cycle amongst all the helminths we are going to get the infection by ingestion of embryonated eggs which are containing the larvae which are going to develop into the adult enterobius in the large intestines and they are going the female is going to come out in the night to lay these plano convex egg on the peri anal skin no passage in the lungs our answer comes to strongyloides corallis next question a truck driver one week after unprotected intercourse developed a painless indurated ulcer with inguinal limb adenopathy which microscope will you use for the motility of the likely etiological agent okay so we have a truck driver who has presented with a painless indurated ulcer we are going to start to think of genital ulcers associated with no pain okay and associated with regional lymphadenopathy okay so our answer here is going to be dark ground microscope or dark field microscope i'll explain why the other options are not the answer one by one so here what first of all let's go through the causes of genital ulcers we basically remember them as painless and painful amongst the painless genital ulcers we have lymphogranuloma venereum which is caused by chlamydia trachomatis l1 l2 and l3 granuloma inguinale caused by klebsiella granulomatis and syphilis which is caused by trachonema pallidum subspecies pallidum okay so that is our diagnosis here because let me say why we are being asked motility of treponema pallidum motility of treponema pallidum what do we describe it as the cork screw motility why are we eliminating these straight away because anyway they are non motile chlamydia is absolutely non motile in fact it's an obligate intracellular and klebsiella all klebsiella are non motile so we are basically looking for this answer motility of treponema pallidum what do we typically dis, uh, see it under the ground microscopy because all treponema and leptospires they are too slender to be seen by the light microscope obviously light microscope is eliminated some students have marked electron microscope how can this electron in do you know electron microscope that means we are since we are using vacuum out there if you use atmospheric air all the electrons are going to be deflected here and there so vacuum is an important component of electron microscope and whenever there is vacuum obviously the organism is going to be dead so you can't see motility under the electron microscope so our answer here is dark ground microscope what is the special feature of a dark ground microscope it's almost similar to the light microscope except for the condensing lens there is a central opaque area here it's called as a central stop of the condensing lens so only the stage is illuminated with a hollow cone of light so this light is only reaching this hollow cone of light is reaching the stage right so the light which is reflected light reaches the observer's eye this is how we can observe the slender organisms typically which we call as spirochetes of course we have one exception the spirochetes the important ones are treponema leptospira borrelia treponema and leptospira are slender but borrelias borrelias are broad b for broad they are broad enough to be seen by the light microscope right so for Uh, treponema and leptospires we need the dark ground microscope and what do we see the motility as let me just show you we will see the motility with the with this typical the this video we can see the typical cork screw motility 
of Treponema pallidum under the dark ground microscope. Next question, a patient is suspected of suffering with acute brucellosis. His serum sample is put up for standard agglutination test. It comes negative. However, on doing the test after serial dilutions of the serum of the patient, the test becomes positive. Which of the following is responsible for the initial negative test? Right, you all must be remembering that in acute brucellosis, we do the standard agglutination test, which is a type of tube agglutination test. An important thing that I've taught you in my videos is just, a, you know, I just ask you to remember three things. They detect IgM antibodies. They are positive. So obviously, th this test can be negative in chronic brucellosis. It is a type of tube agglutination test. And it is typically associated with prozone phenomenon. Okay, so our answer here is prozone. What is prozone? So basically, when a patient is having acute brucellosis, the titer of antibodies, which is IgM antibodies, which is detected by the standard agglutination test, is sometimes so high. There is such a high titer of these antibodies that if you take the neat serum and add the brucella antigens, add the brucella abortus antigens to look for agglutination. Because the antibodies are in such a high teeter, the nice lattice of alternating antigen and antibodies does not form. So you do not see it as a positive. So it gives a false negative reaction. And that false negative is called as prozone because of this high titer of antibodies in meat serum. So how do we overcome prozone phenomenon? We always put up serial dilutions of the patient serum like this. Dilution 1 is to 20, 1 is to 40 and so on. And add the antigens. And when the antigens and antibodies are present in equivalent proportions, they will form this nice network, the lattice of alternating antigen antibody complexes, that's the time you're going to typically see the maximum precipitation or the maximum agglutination. Okay. So remember the zone phenomenon is that the and precipitation or agglutination is seen only when the antigens and antibodies are present in equivalent proportions. When there is in the earlier set of test tubes, the antibody is in excess, the lattice does not form. In the latter, further dilutions, the antigen is in excess, again, that lattice does not form. And so this is called as prozone, this is called as postzone. So here, what, the, what was talked in the question that in acute, then the uh, meat serum, the test was negative, but when serial dilutions were done, then it came positive. That means that was antibody excess in the need serum, with, which was overcome. This prozone was overcome by serial dilutions. I would also like to remember the same thing applies to the VDRL test that we use for the diagnosis of syphilis. Here also the titer of antibodies of in, is so high that if you do it on a need serum, it all generally comes false negative. So always we do the VDRL in that VDRL slide. Remember that thick slide with those 12 wells? That's for the serial dilutions of the serum of the patient. Okay. So our answer in that this question was prozone phenomenon. Next question, a 35-year-old male presents to the OPD with complaints of progressive swelling of his left thigh region. Peripheral blood sample was taken and stained with GIMSA. Microscopy showed sheathed microfilaria with no nuclei in the tail. Which of the following is the most likely agent responsible for the symptoms? Okay, so when you start to think of microfilaria, you immediately start to think of the tissue nematodes, Mucharia, Brugia, Oncosarca, Loa Loa, Mansonella. Those are the ones associated with microfilaria. So let's read the option. What is the likely agent? Brugia malai, 
Brugia Timori, Mucheria Bancrofti, or Mansonella Perstens. Okay. Our answer to this question, so here, progressive swelling of his left thigh region. This is what some students have told me. This is suggestive of some lymphatics getting affected. They're leading to lymphedema. And what is telling us the diagnosis is the presence of sheathed microfilaria. The moment you read sheathed microfilaria, immediately oncocerca and mansonella are out because they are unsheathed microfilaria. So now you're going to concentrate on brugia, abutraria, and you are lower. Okay. Plus, what is mentioned? No nuclei in the tail tip. So progressive swelling, lymphedema with no nuclei in the tail tip of the sheath microfilaria. Your diagnosis immediately comes to Ucheria bankrupti. Okay. So lymphatic filaris is caused by brugia and Ucheria and thereof. So let's just go quickly go through sheath microfilaria are seen in, as I said, Ucheria, brugia as well as loa loa. Unsheathed microfilaria are seen with mansolena and oncocercus. These are directly eliminated from the options the moment you re read the word sheet. Okay. Now, microfilaria are present in the blood. Here, they were present in the peripheral blood smear, they, which was stained with Jeemsa stain. So, in blood, where are, uh, these are present in case of Vujraria, both the Brugia species, lower. In case of Mansonella ozardi and Mansonella perstens, microfilaria will be demonstrable in the blood of the patient. Where are the microfilaria present in case of Oncocerca and Mansonella streptocerca? They are seen in the skin biopsies. Okay. So if in case it's a skin biopsy, mention the question, you are going to keep Oncocerca and Mansonella streptocerca in your mind only when you're seeing the microfilaria out there. But in case they're present in blood, you're going to have all these in your differential diagnosis. Okay. And also remember that when you are studying all these parasites or certain organisms which have typical geographic distribution, especially, you know, trematodes like schistosomes are not reported from India. They, they would be reported from Africa. They would be reported from South America. Certain fungal infections are only reported from central, certain countries. You have to keep that geographic distribution in your mind so that you can quickly arrive at the answer. Do not waste your time in the exams. For your kind information, oncocerciasis is not reported from India. Okay, it is only reported from Africa. Mansonella ozardi from South America. Sorry, oncocerca from Africa as well as South America. Then Mansonella ozardi only from South America, Loa Loa only from Africa, Mansonella perstens only from Africa. So these can be easily eliminated by the fact that they are not reported from India. So how can we think of a condition? In, of course, if, if it's an immigrant that you have to analyze at that time. Okay, so that tells. So just let's go through the. Uh, microfilaria, which are sheathed. We just learned Bucheria, Brugia, and Loa Loa. So, what are these? This is the sheath is present in all the three of them. And what helped her arrive at the answer as Bucheria is the fact that it has no nuclei in the tail tip. In case of Brugia Malay, there are two nuclei present in the tail. In case of Brugia Timori, which is only reported from the Timor island of Indonesia. There are many nuclei in the tail. Many nuclei in the tail. Okay. So I hope there is no confusion. What did we, how did we arrive at the diagnosis? The fact that they were sheathed microfilaria in the blood tells us this is either brugia or it is bucheraria or it is lower low. Now, since the question is talking about no nuclei in the tail tip, that tells us this is area immediately, which is responsible for that lymphedema, the progressive swelling of the leg. Okay. Right. So just remember the geographic distribution of all these uh, organisms is very, very important for you to save time in the exam. Right. So but the other options, why are they? Because these would be, as I just explained, they have nuclei in the tail tip. And Mansonella be eliminated by the fact that the microfilaria out here are 
and shaped. We move on to our next question. One week after an unprotected intercourse, a 25-year-old male develops urethral discharge, which was shown in the figure. What do you see? Typical purulent urethral discharge. The moment you think of, see this, what are you going to think of? You're going to think of gonococcus causing gonorrhea. Which of the following is the likely etiology? Trichomonas, herpes, miseria gonorri, or urea plasma, urea liticum. Your answer comes straight forward as miseria gonorri. Why do we avoid the straightforward things in our exam? Why do we ignore these you know, clinching points. It's a purulent urethral discharge. The first organism you're going to think of is gonococcus. Why are we thinking of urea plasma, urea liticum? Why do we think that our examiners always ask the vaguest things? Why don't we think of the straightforward answers? So some of you have marked urea plasma, urea liticum as the answer. Why? Justify. Purulent discharge is typically associated with gonococcus. Trichomonas is associated with the frothy, greenish, foul-smelling discharge. So that can be eliminated. Okay, And herpes is typically associated with those vesicular uh, or ulcerative lesions on the genitals. So you would have some genital lesions out there. Here it's just a urethritis. No genital lesions are seen. So our answer here is miseria gonorrhea. Coming to our next question, a patient hailing from Uttar Pradesh presented with high grade fever. On examination, he has pallor, hepatosplenomegaly. Peripheral smear examination showed pancytopenia. Buffy coat examination showed macrophages laden with organisms with kinetoplast. Vector of the likely disease the patient has is sexy fly, sand fly, anopheles, and triatome bug. So the key points in this question is the fact that the patient is hailing from Uttar Pradesh. The patient has symptoms of pallor, hepatosplenomegaly, and examination shows pancytopenia and macrophages laden with organisms containing kinetoplast. Okay, so we have the bone marrow occupied by macrophages, which is laden with organisms with kinetoplast. What is your diagnosis? Kala Azar or visceral leishmaniasis, the vector of which is sand fly. Okay, so this is how you put things together. Whenever you read the word kinetoplast, you go to my videos there. It is typically mentioned that kinetoplast is present in just leishmania and trypanosomes. This kinetoplast is, a. we'll come back to this slide later. Kinetoplast is, is basically a unique type of mitochondrial DNA, which is present in some flagellate protozoa. And what are those? Leishmania and trypanosomes. It is composed of the parasympasal body and the blepharoplast. Okay. So, kinetoplast present only in these two. So, these are going to come in our differential diagnosis at present. Okay. Now, another thing I wanted to highlight to you, there is a typical pentad of symptoms which is typically mentioned in the questions on Kalazar. Patient has prolonged fever, progressive weight loss, pronounced hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia and sometimes even hypergamma globulinemia. This is a characteristic pentad of Kalazar. Fever, hepatosplenomegaly, weight loss, pancytopenia, hypergamma globulinemia. Okay, these are the uh, typically mentioned the questions, and these are the A mastic goats, the LD bodies that the question was talking about. The macrophages are loaded with the A mastic goats, the LD bodies of the Leishmania donovani. Okay, so you can see that double dot in the amastigotes kinetoplast is that one dot and the other is the nucleus in the amastigotes. Okay, right. Now I wanted to show you this, that this kinetoplast is present in 
both the infective form for man that is the promastigote this is the kinetoplast present just close to the flag where the flagellum is originating and it is also present in the amastigote stage of which is the ld body inside the macrophages right now some of you would ask me why not the other options obviously we can eliminate anopheles because that is a transmitting uh, plasmodium so we are going to think sexy fly is the vector for sleeping sickness isn't that so the sleeping sickness is caused by yes trypanosomes this is causing chagas disease even this is caused by the trypanosoma cruzi chagas disease how did we eliminate these as the answer both these diseases are not reported from india at all sleeping sickness is african trypanosomiasis and here the patient is originating from uttar pradesh in india we only have leishmania which is having the kinetoplast and chagas disease again it's called south american trypanosomiasis had the question talked about the patient is an immigrant from africa is an immigrant from south america we would have thought of either of these vectors but here leishmaniasis is our diagnosis the vector of which is sand fly okay our next question an aids patient with cd4 counts of 55 per microliter presents with fever productive cough for the last 5 days x ray chest shows lobar consolidation in the right infrascapular region which of the following is the likely cause of the symptoms in the patient mycoplasma pneumoniae streptococcus pneumoniae pneumocystis erythrocyte staphylococcus aureus now what is the clue what are the clues given here it's an immunocompromised com patient with very low cd4 counts 55 per microliter with a fever and productive cough with low bar pneumonia now many of you in your exam are going to the moment you read those low cd4 counts in aids patient pneumonia you're going to start to think of pneumocystis as your answer but guys and girls if you have kept your composure you would have thought immediately what are the typical x ray findings it's a bilateral interstitial pneumonia and it is associated with very less sputum it's a non productive cuff the productive cuff is mentioned lobar consolidation is mentioned your diagnosis is lobar pneumonia in this aids patient what is the first organism that strikes you that causes lobar pneumonia the answer is streptococcus pneumoniae here so this is how examiners can trick you into arriving at the wrong answer pneumocystis is not your answer here okay so this is the typical bilateral interstitial pneumonia which generally starts with infiltration in the perihilar regions and then it spreads to the rest of the lungs okay so that why that's why our answer here is streptococcus pneumonia not pneumocystis erythrocyte the most common cause of lobar pneumonia is streptococcus pneumonia of course we have other causes like staphylococcus aureus or it could be mofilus influenza etc but here these are fortunately not in any way whenever you get such a question you will think of the most common cause of that particular condition at this time okay so our answer here is streptococcus pneumonia acha why not mycoplasma pneumonia because here mycoplasma is also generally associated with very less production of cough and it's generally of course we're going to again think of low, most common cause of lobar pneumonia next question while shifting a patient receiving an emergency blood transfusion there is an accidental spill of the blood in the ambulance which of the following should be used to disinfect this blood spill that is such a simple question it's a blood spill in the ambulance what do we use for infectious blood spills we always use sodium hypochlorite also called as household bleach so the sodium hypochlorite which is uh, available in our hospitals is contain 5 to 6% of sodium hypochlorite 
and whenever there is any kind of blood spill it may be mentioned it's an hiv patient it's a hepatitis b patient whose blood has got spilled on the floor anyway your answer is always going to be sodium hypochlorite now if the blood spill is less than 10 ml that means now you're going to dilute it this con this one is to 100 with water if the blood spill is more than 10 ml then the dilution factor is 1 is to 10 in water okay so basically it is around in this case it would be 0.05% of sodium hypochlorite in this it would be 0.5% of sodium hypochlorite now let's quickly go through the steps of this infectious this infection of an infectious blood spill the moment such an accident occur you're going to block off the area of the spill till the whole process of disinfection is done you're going to wear your personal protective equipment especially a pair of we don't need to wear sterile gloves here non sterile disposable gloves a uh, better to wear a gown over it a face shield use tongs or a pan and a brush to sweep up the broken glass don't pick it up with your hands even if they are gloved discard the broken glass in a sharp container put lots of absorbent paper towels over it and just sweep it up pick it up with your gloved hand and put it in a plastic garbage bag after you have picked up most of that blood with the paper towels now you're going to pour on all contaminated areas sodium hypochlorite of course this is i have already told you point this is considering that it is more than 10 ml of blood spill so pour it leave it for about 10 to 20 minutes in that zone and then wipe up this bleach solution with paper towels again and put them in the same plastic garbage bag as earlier now remove your gloves put them in the same plastic dispose them off in the same plastic garbage bag and double bag and send them off for disposal and then after that you're going to clean that area with as usual with detergent and water and thoroughly wash your hands with soap and water and finally inform the authorities that yes there has been a blood spill out here okay that's our last step information of the concerned authorities so at the end of this session i would just like to congratulate those students who have been able to fare well in this exam and a word to those students who did not fare well who are not sure of what seat they are going to get whether they are going to have their dream seat or not in their dream college just a word if uh, don't lose heart you know failures are a part of success just have to keep on trying and uh, later in life you're going to remember these turbulent times with a smile on your face these kinds of failure are part of life don't think that we have reached this age without failures all of us have our trials in our life and hopefully all of you are going to do well in life so guys and girls if you are determined to learn no one can stop you so welcome to our discussion on the microbiology mcqs which were asked in the ini cet exam of july 2021 So since these are recall based MCQs the language of the questions might slightly be different from the original but I've tried my best to get all the question correct as well as the options correct so let's get started so our first question was an image based question the figure shows the life cycle of which of the following now this is a very very complex life cycle and anyone would get sight by looking at it first of all this is a it is not even clarifying which part of the life cycle is seen in human which is seen in the host or the definitive host and so on so what only things we can register is something that is ingestion ingestion is the mode of infection with whatever parasite it is so the parasites mentioned the options are cryptosporidium toxoplasma plasmodium and cystoisospora how do we eliminate plasmodium as the answer because plasmodium is acquired by the bite of the mosquito so all the other three are acquired by ingestion 
Now, what is going to help us arrive at the answer as being toxoplasma is the fact that you are seeing something very unique to toxoplasma and that is endodiogeny. Endodiogeny. This is a mechanism of asexual replication which is seen only in toxoplasma. I'm talking about the pathogenic protozoa. I'll just show you the picture soon. Okay. So endodiogeny. Then another thing that is unique to toxoplasma is the presence of tachyzoids, the presence of cyst-containing bradyzoids in the life cycle. Nowhere else do you get these stages in the life, any one of them. Okay. So endodiogeny, tachyzoids, bradyzoids, all these. So this is a bigger view of the same. So ingestion is the mode of infection. And we are seeing this asexual replication, tachyzoids, bradyzoids, that is telling you this is toxoplasma, though you may not understand anything else in the life cycle. So that's the tissue cyst which is containing these bradyzoids. When it is ingested, the trophozoids, uh, these bradyzoids are going to be released. They will invade the mucosal cells and they will undergo sexual reproduction. We do not need to go into these stages of the life cycle because all these stages of sexual replication are occurring in the definitive host, that is the cat in case, in case of toxoplasma. So what passes out in the stool of the cat is the oocyst, which is unsporulated. In the environment, after a couple of days, it becomes sporulated to become the infective form for man. When this sporulated oocyst is ingested, the tachyzoids, with, though it is containing sporozoids, they will convert into tachyzoids on release. They will initially multiply in the intestinal mucosal cells of humans or the other intermediate hosts like sheep and uh, cows, etc., or rodents. And <clears throat> these tachyzoids, after multiplying in the intestinal mucosal cells, they will be released into the more and more of numbers will be released into the bloodstream. They will infect the macrophages and they will be carried out to the various organs of the body like the brain, heart, lung, eyes, muscles and so on. Okay, So all this is occurring in the intermediate host that is humans. These stages are occurring in the reservoir that is a definitive host that is the cat. Okay. Now, this is pretty complex. Now, how did we eliminate cryptosporidium? Because cryptosporidium, we do not see tachyzoids or we do not see bradyzoids, etc. Okay. Now, I'll come to the life cycle soon. Just took a quick refresher to a couple of things regarding toxoplasma. Endodiogeny. This is typically seen as asexual replication in case of toxoplasma, where the two daughter cells two daughter cells are arising within the mother cell and the uh, when, when they are mature, they will just consume this mother cell. So this mother cell is destroyed and these two daughter cells are uh, released. Okay, So that is endodiogeny, a mechanism of asexual replication only seen in toxoplasma. Also remember what are the modes of infection in case of toxoplasma for humans. As we just learned, the definitive host is cats and the intermediate host can be humans. So what is the mode of infection? Ingestion of sporulated oocysts, which develops in the environment. So this can occur when we are cleaning, you know, a cat litter box. Another mode of infection is ingestion of Tissue cysts in animal meat, all these animal meats are containing, tissue, poorly cooked um, animal meat contains these tissue cysts. Okay, So these two are both infective to humans. It can also be transmitted by a blood transfusion. Here the infective form is tachyzoids. Organ transplantation, here the infective form is tissue cysts and vertical transmission from the mother to the child, fetus by other tachyzoids crossing the placenta. Okay, So, of course, the most common mode of infection in humans is ingestion. Okay. Coming to the life cycle of the other mentioned ones, this is the life cycle of cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium is also acquired by ingestion and the infective form is the sporulated oocyst, which is ingested from this 
sporozoites are released they will invade these mucosal cells and they will develop over near the apical aspect extra cytoplasmic location they will form trophozoites trophozoites will give rise to the type 1 neurons which are the asexual forms and these lots of them will develop they will be released and they will invade wade fresh mucosal cells after a few cycles of this asexual replication some of the merozoites give rise rather some of the trophozoites form type 2 merons these type 2 merons will give rise to the macro and the micro gametocytes which will fuse with each other to form the zygotes zygote will form two types of oocysts the thin walled oocysts which are responsible for internal auto infection and the thick walled oocysts which will be uh, passed out in the stool and they uh, they become the infective form for humans these uh, sporulated oocysts the sporulation in case of cryptosporidium is occurring within the host that is the human that is why they can cause auto infection so the sporozoites are already developed in the oocyst right in the case of tau toxoplasma it was different the sporulation was occurring in the environment after being passed out in the cat feces so this these are the sporulated oocysts passed out in the stool and responsible also for internal auto infection so both this is internal auto infection and the one which is present in the feces can be causing external auto infection by a contaminated thing coming to the life cycle of isospora that is that was also one of the options which we could not eliminate because even this is acquired by ingestion i hope you all know cryptospora cysto isospora and cyclospora they are all famous as causing cause, causes of diarrhea in hiv patients okay so here again the infective form is the sporulated oocyst in all the three that we are studying the sporulated oocyst is the infective form this is ingest ingested the uh, trophozoite is going to be formed trophozoite is going to form merozoites after a few cycles the um, type 2 merozoites will be formed they will form microgametes and macrogametes they will fuse with each other to form the zygote zygote will then mature into the oocyst but here the oocysts which are passed out in the feces are unsporulated oocysts in case of cystoisospora okay so not yet sporulated so they cannot cause auto infection they will mature in the environment to develop the sporozoites and that will become the infective form for humans did we understand how we eliminated that uh, the, these because here we are not seeing any endotiogeny tachyzoids bradyzoids the only things we are seeing are the sporozoites and we are seeing the trophozoite and the merons okay moving on to our next question again a question on parasites which of the following statements is true regarding trematodes okay trematodes or flukes remember the leaf like elements first option says facial abscess busky is seen in the intrahepatic biliary radicals so first of all please register we have to form the uh, find the true statement schistosomes are monoecious meaning they are hermaphrodites that's the other meaning of monoecious triclopendazole is the treatment of choice for all trematode infections this i'm going to immediately say this is false because for all trematode infections what is the drug of choice praziquantel is the drug of choice except in case of the fasciola species where the drug of choice is triclopendazole okay in all the others the uh, treatment of choice is praziquantel left next option says fasciola hepatica is acquired through contaminated water caltrop water caltrop is a type of water plant it is also called as a water chestnut okay so please remember i cannot go to through teaching everything about trematodes here itself or flukes so just to go through so here the only true statement is that fasciola hepatica is acquired by ingestion of contaminated caltrops water plants which are containing metasarcaria now what is wrong in this option 
facial lobsis buski is a gastrointestinal trematode. It is found in the duodenal and the jejunal lumen. Okay, schistosomes are the exceptions. All trematodes otherwise are hermaphrodites, but schistosomes are bisexual. They are dioecious. So this is wrong. Biliary radicals is wrong. And we also know that triclobendazole is not the drug of choice for all trematodes. Okay, just go through, let's go through the important points about trematodes. Flukes or her, uh, uh, these are all hermaphrodites except schistosomes which are dioecious or bisexual. All trematodes have two intermediate hosts in their life cycle. The definitive host, of course, is humans and other mammals. They have two intermediate hosts, that is snails and freshwater fish or freshwater plants. And the example of plants meaning water chestnut, water cress or water caltrop. Cress, caltrop, which is also called as water chestnut. Except for schistosomes, which have only one intermediate host in their life cycle, and that intermediate host is snail. Whenever you think of snail, think of trematodes. All of them have the intermediate host of snail in their life cycle. All are acquired by ingestion. And what is that infective form? That infective form is metasarcaria, which is present either in freshwater fish or freshwater unwashed water plants. Except in case of schistosomes, here they are acquired by skin penetration. And here the infective form is cercarie. The infective form is cercarie penetrating the human skin. Right? So that's just a brief overview of the flukes. Now let's find out what are the habitat. They have all the flukes have differential habitats. So some of them are found in the biliary radicals or biliary tree. So which are these? The two fasciola species, fasciola hepatica, fasciola gigantica. Then we have clonorchis sinensis and opisthorchis felinius and opisthorchis vivarini. So coming to the gastrointestinal ones, fasciolopsis buski, that was what was the wrong option. These are found in the GI lumen, not in the intrahepatic biliary radicals. Metagonimus heterophys and gastrodiscoides are also GI flukes. So these are localizing in the small intestine. This is called as the colonic fluke gastrodiscoides. Blood flukes which are present in the uh, venous plexuses. Schistosoma mansoni found in the inferior mesenteric plexus. Japonicum present in the superior mesenteric plexus. And hematobium present in the vesicle plexus. The only one which is found in the lungs is the lung fluke or the oriental lung fluke that is Paragonimus westermanni. So variable habitat, you have to remember which one is found where. Okay, now one, which of them is associated with ingestion of metasarcaria in poorly cooked fishes? These are clonorchis, opisthorchis, metagonimus and heterophys. The ones which are associated with plants are fasciola, hepatica and gigantica. Fischolopsis buski, Paragonimus vestabeni does not come here, it comes here. Paragonimus is crab or crayfish. Crab or crayfish associated. So Fischola, Fischolopsis buski and gastrodiscoides are associated with the water, caltrop, chestnut, whatever I told you. Right. So these are what is the infective form? Metasarcaria. Of course, we also have registered the fact that schistosomes are acquired not by ingestion. They are acquired by penetration of the skin by cercaria. So that basically answers our question. So our answer only correct statement here is facial hepatica is acquired through contaminated water caltrop, which is containing the metasarcaria. The other statements all are incorrect. Next question, a 32-year-old laborer working at a construction site presented with fever and hemoptysis. The sputum sample collected for examination showed the following appearance. The smear will be stained by which of the following sequences? Okay, this is a query tuberculosis patient. 
hemoptysis with fever and we have done the acid fast stain can you see against a blue background you can see these magenta colored bacilli acid fast stain and what are the steps of the acid fast stain our primary stain is carbol fusion so after fixing the smear in heat we are going to pour our primary stain carbol fusion how do we prepare carbol fusion basic fusion is dissolved in phenol after pouring this we are going to intermittently heat the slide making sure that the slide does not the carbol fusion doesn't start to boil okay and so for 3 to 5 minutes after draining off the carbol fusion we are going to wash it with distilled water and then pour the decolorizer the decolorizer that is preferentially used for diagnosis of my, uh, tuberculosis is acid alcohol 3% of hydrochloric acid dissolved in 95% of acid alcohol 95% uh, of ethanol the reason is because we do not use 20% of h2so4 as the decolorizer because both mycobacterium tuberculosis and all the atypical mycobacteria which can be present in the environment like the soil and water are acid fast with the same concentration of sulfuric acid that is 20% we don't want that confusion of the atypical mycobacteria being responsible for a false positive sputum smear that is why we use acid alcohol as the decolorizer now some of you might be wondering what is ma'am saying why are we using acid alcohol i did not understand the reason for this is that mycobacterium tuberculosis is both acid as well as alcohol fast it resists decolorization with both acids like h2so4 as well as alcohol whereas atypical mycobacteria these are only acid fast they are not alcohol fast that means when we are going to use acid alcohol as the decolorizer the sputum smear will come positive only with mpb not with the atypical mycobacteria meaning positive for acid uh, acid fast bacilli the atypical mycobacteria will get decolorized by that alcohol used in the decolorizing agent okay after pouring this acid alcohol now again just drain it with uh, wash it wash the slide with water and now pour the counter stain the counter stain commonly used is methylene blue alternative to methylene blue could be picric acid and malachite green accordingly we are going to see the black the blue background or a yellow background or a green background against which we are going to see the magenta colored acid fast bacilli okay so that is pretty easy question see sometimes you get such simple questions in your exams steps of gram staining sub steps of acid fast staining sometimes you can be asked steps of albert staining and so on so you need to be knowing your basic questions also very well next question a 55 year old patient had a tooth extraction 3 days back he now presents with a mass in the sub mandibular region which is otherwise asymptomatic so he's just presented with a mass here there is no ulcer on the oral mucosa on drainage of the discharge it is foul smelling with a lot of yellow granules they show gram positive filamentous rods on gram staining what is the most likely implicated pathogen so here what are the clues to our answer one it's a tooth extraction which has followed which has been followed up by this complication of a mass in the submandibular region it is painless and when we drain the mass what did we get we got sulfur granules the moment we hear sub read sulfur granules what are we going to think of actinomycosis this is lumpy jaw or cervico facial actinomycosis and what is going to confirm my diagnosis is the fact we are seeing the gram positive filamentous rods on gram staining my answer undoubtedly confidently is going to be actinomycetes israeli okay 
the other are the fungi of course these are not gram they would not be taking up the gram stain anyway okay so moment you read gram positive filamentous rod we think of the family actinomycetes and we have two important genera out here of course one more point i wanted to remember is branching rods they also show branching gram positive filamentous branching rods think of family actinomycetes here we have two important genera the genus actinomyces please think don't confuse the family name with the genus name this is actinomyces genus and genus nogardia okay and how do we do two important differential characters between these two are the fact that actinomyces are generally obligate anaerobes they are non acid fast whereas the genus nocardia are strict aerobes or obligate aerobes and they are partially acid fast okay so you can demonstrate those gram uh, sorry filamentous rods showing branches even on the modified zn stain then your answer is going to be nocardia okay many times we have got this question in aims exam we are shown these magenta colored rods with a blue background identify the bacterium identify the stain that time it will be nocardia and the stain will be the modified zn or the modified kenyon stain will be there in the options okay so actinomycosis as was the diagnosis in this case is of four types basically actinomyces are present as normal commensals at various sites in our body like the oral cavity gi tract or the vagina okay and how do they gain and how do they cause disease they are normal commensals but the moment they gain entry into the sterile tissues they are going to cause disease they are going to multiply provoke an inflammatory response which is associated with fibrosis and the tiny tiny aggregates of the bacterium are going to look like sulfur granules okay so they resemble you know malignancies nodular hard lesions which are not uh, painless okay so depending upon the site where they gain entry into the sterile tissues it is going to be cervico facial actinomycosis here characteristically as was mentioned in this question there is a history of some oral surgery a dental extraction was mentioned here or a patient with poor dental hygiene or patient has had a recent radiation therapy the second type of actinomycosis is thoracic actinomycosis here generally there is a history of aspiration of some oropharyngeal contents like some the patient has had a seizure or the patient has had a recent you know has had an alcohol binging that was associated with aspiration of these oropharyngeal secretions and the patient presents with you know a type of a pneumonia which sometimes you know these lesions they the nodular uh, inflammatory response can open onto the surfaces and forming sinuses from which you you can see the granules coming out the third type of abdominal actinomycosis here generally there is a history of abdominal surgery or there might be a history of appendicitis or there might be a history of diverticulitis and so on so that led to the entry of the actinomyces into the sterile abdominal um, cavity and lastly pelvic actinomycosis is associated with an iucd use it might be an existing iucd already there or it might be a removed iucd of course that's a very very important actinomyces is very very commonly asked question moving on to our next question a patient is brought to the emergency with severe watery diarrhea and vomiting for the last several hours on questioning he says that his stools look like rice water which of the following will be disrupted in the intestines okay watery diarrhea vomiting and the rice water stools what is this patient suffering with cholera okay so what is disrupted amongst these hemidesmosomes gap junctions 
zonula gludens zona zona adherens the answer is zona occludens okay so we know of cholera toxin i have talked about this zona of zot toxin in my regular videos in marrow so there is a special accessory toxin some uh, minor toxins produced by vibrio cholerae apart from the most important of course the cholera toxin okay let's quickly go through the important virulence factors of vibrio cholerae the ones which cause cholera of course o1 and o139 this is uh, first one is the toxin co-regulated pili so pili or common fimbriae which help in adhesion to the small intestinal mucosa once they have adhered now they will take out their most important uh, weapon that is the cholera toxin which is a classical example of an a b 5 subunit toxin 1a the active part b meant for binding so what does the b subunit bind to it binds to the g and 1 gangliosides on the surface of the intestinal mucosal cells and the toxin gets endocytosed and what is the a subunit the active part the active part is further divided into a1 plus a2 and it is the a1 part which is responsible for the main action what does it do it transfers an adp ribose moiety to the alpha subunit of the g stimulatory protein so we have the g stimulatory and the g inhibitory protein which are controlling the activity of the adenyl cyclase enzyme so here the g stimulatory protein its alpha subunit gets adp ribosylated as a result of which what is happening it says i am now going to continuously get activated so this activation of the g stimulatory proteins leads to the persistent activation of adenyl cyclase as a result of which there is massive increase in cyclic amp in the mucosal cells okay remember the toxins which act by increasing cyclic amp the classical example is the cholera toxin and this leads to the pumping out of ions into the intestinal lumen so it's a secretory diarrhea then the other accessory toxins are the zot we call them as minor toxins zot zonula occludens toxin disrupts the zonula occludens that was what was asked this is a repeat it was asked also in 2015 and the accessory cholera enterotoxin is another minor toxin which also induces the secretion of ions so these are contributing to the watery diarrhea seen in a patient of cholera of course the two most important virulence factors remain the cholera toxin and the tcp okay our next question was again an image based question a forest guard returned from the forest so you have an occupation mentioned when forest what happens we all get bites with insects so this is most likely an insect bite acquired infection and few days later he presents with a skin lesion as shown <clears throat> eschcar pick is there so this is a picture of an eschcar all of the following could be the etiologies except it could be an anthrax basically they are asking us that eschcar is seen in all of the following except okay so it can be seen in scrub typhus absolutely correct which type okay let me first come back to anthrax which type of anthrax is associated with the formation of an eschcar at the site of entry of the spore that is cutaneous anthrax also called as wool sorter's disease okay <clears throat> so it could be cutaneous anthrax or it could be scrub typhus when the chiggers of the trombiculate mites they bite they lead to the formation of eschcar this type of lesion they can be seen also with the brown recluse spider bite okay the spider might have bitten this forest guard but the bite of the hard tick in case of kaisenu forest disease is not associated with the formation of an eschcar okay so our answer here is KFD Kaisenur forest disease remember these infections are associated with typical eschcar at the site of 
the bite or the site of entry of the organism, cutaneous anthrax or Hyde Porter's disease, all the spotted fevers like Indian tick typhus, uh, botanus fever, Kenyan tick typhus, rickettsial pox, but not seen in case of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. That's a very, very important exception. Then it is seen in scrub typhus and it's also seen in brown recluse spider bite. Of course, this beats me. I honestly did not know this spider bite leads to this typical lesion, Eshgar. I, of course, knew these three conditions. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on to our next question, a 22-year-old female comes to the OPD with a swelling on the left side of the face. Okay, this is, was the image. She has a history of a traumatic injury with a wooden stick two months back. Whenever we get a history of injury with a vegetative matter, think of fungal infections. Sinuses were normal on radiography. Grokot's methanamine stain was positive. The moment we read methanamine, it could be Grokot's, Gridley's or Gomory's methanamine silver. That means our line of thought was correct. Injury with a vegetative matter followed by the GMS stain coming positive in the tissue biopsy. It's a fungal cause. Okay. It could be any fungus, of course. So now let's read the options. IgG4 related disease, phycomycosis, NK cell granuloma, lethal midline granuloma. The only fungal disease that I can think or I can read here is phycomycosis. This is the other name of zygomycosis, which is now called as mucormycosis. So actually, this is wrong to write. It's an obsolete name. In fact, even zygomycosis is an obsolete name. Now the new name is mucormycosis. So our answer here is phycomycosis, newer name of which is mucormycosis. The other diseases would not give the GMS stain coming positive. Okay. So mucormycosis, you must be wondering, there is no risk factor mentioned here because this is cutaneous mucormycosis, which can occur in a healthy individual following trauma with a vegetative matter. Right. So our answer here is option B, meth, uh, phycomycosis. Now let's quickly review uh, zygomycosis or mucormycosis to be correct that it is generally seen in people who have certain specified risk factors. Typically mentioned in the question is poorly controlled diabetes, okay? Then steroid therapy, elevated levels of free iron. Iron acts as a growth factor for the mucorails. Growth factor for mucorails. I hope you remember that mucormycosis is caused by mucorails, which are type of aseptate molds. Then treatment with deferoxamine. Deferoxamine actually is an iron chelator, but surprisingly, it has been found that it acts as a siderophore for the mucorails. It gets them fungi. Look, I got you iron. So it, of course, we know that iron is acting as a growth factor for all mucorails. Then neutropenia is a risk factor, hematological malignancies, then immunosuppressive therapy, which may be given for transplant, uh, solid organ or uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients. Okay, so all these people are at risk factors of developing mucormycosis. Now coming to the types of mucormycosis, the most common type of mucormycosis, as we just saw recently, was rhinocerebral or rhinooculocerebral mucormycosis, where the infection starts from the sinuses and then gradually spreads to the orbit and can spread also to the brain. The second type, which are rarer, are pulmonary, which is acquired by inhalation or gastrointestinal by ingestion. And as we just saw in this patient, cutaneous mucormycosis, which can, which can occur in a patient who has no specified risk factor. 
and lastly disseminated mucormycosis which has mortality rates which may be even more than 90% is disseminated okay so highly fatal disease mucormycosis <clears throat> so here the diagnosis was cutaneous mucormycosis now coming to the morphology what do we see in the biopsies how do we describe all mucorails with like rhizopus mucor uh, lichthemia that they are typically described as aseptate also called as cenocytic hyphae which are showing acute sorry obtuse angle or 90 degree angled branching so aseptate these hyphae are sometimes described in the question as ribbon like hyphae ribbon like broad ribbon like hyphal forms if you get this kind of picture can you see they are very very broad i'll we have another question on fungi that will show you the slender hyphae of uh, the septate moods so here is the broad you know this 90 degree angled branching broad branching right so next question a young male underwent an intestinal resection surgery a quite a controversial question and the following worms of 0.8 to 1.2 cm size were seen attached to the intestinal wall so these this was an image based question the size was mentioned around 1 cm which of the following statements is true regarding this now flame cells are seen below the pharynx flame cells are excretory cells of the cestodes okay the tapeworms cutting plates and hooks are seen okay so as we know let's first consider this one we learned that these are present in cestodes or tapeworm all the cestodes which are present in humans does this look like a cestode can you see any segmentation we can see that this is most likely a nematode it's not a fluke flukes are all leaf like so this is a nematode so this rules out our first option because flame cells are seen below the flame cells are seen in cestodes let's read the next option 12 to 14 proglottids proglottids are called as segments segments are seen again in cestodes now i am immediately now going to left with these two options globular swelling at the base of the esophagus god knows where this is present this is actually present in the rhabdity form larvae of strongyloides okay so uh, when you look at this this looks an inviting option why because this are present in hookworms hookworms are very small in size you may think that they are sucking the blood they would be long big and ones but i generally mention the size in my videos the size of this thing is very important there are around 1 cm in size and that's what is mentioned this so our answer here is going to be option b cutting plates and hooks are seen cutting plates and hooks are seen these are the things that by which they attach to the intestinal mucosa and they suck the patient's blood okay so many of you were thinking this was ascaris but we have no property of ascaris mentioned here and guys and girls please remember that ascaris is huge in size it was asked last year in the form of this kind of a question you got this image based question and you were asked to identify what helminth this is this is ascaris ascaris is 35 to 50 cm long that's half a meter long this is the size of ascaris how can they be 1 cm in size so obviously the answer to this is hookworms hookworms that is ankylostoma duodenale and so that's the size of the hookworms ankylostoma duodenale and nicator americanus their mouth parts are the plates and the cutting teeth now this is the vent teeth in case of ankylostoma how to remember which has teeth which has cutting plates 
think when you, you this has ankylostoma the stoma word means basically a mouth or an opening ankylostoma what does your mouth contain your mouth contains teeth so just remember that ankylostoma contains teeth whereas nicator contains plates they contain plates for sucking the patient attaching to the mucosa and sucking the blood okay right so these are the adults of hookworms which are about 1 cm in size and mouth parts teeth and the cutting plates that was our answer so how did we eliminate it this proglottids are segments of cestodes flame cells are excretory cells of cest uh, cestodes again so our answer to this question was cutting plates there is nothing like a globular swelling at the base of esophagus present in anyone it's only seen in larval stages of strongylitis a patient presented with fever dyspnea palpitations and tachycardia echocardiography revealed vegetations on the septal leaflets so this is an endocarditis tissue sections from them reveal the following findings as shown in the image what is the most likely implicated agent so looking at this image can you see that there is green background and you can see some tubular structures which are most likely hyphae which are black in color so what stain is this this is gomorrhees or gridleys or grocots methanamine silver stain and if i'll just show you the bigger uh, picture of the same you can see these this is showing the the red structure the red arrows is showing the dicotomous branching or acute angled branching or branching at 45 degrees and the yellow arrows are showing you distinct septations they are showing you septations these are the septations you can appreciate carefully so what does this tell you a septate hyphae showing dicotomous branching this is definitely aspergillus acute angled branching and aspergillus is your answer okay right so uh, let's eliminate the other options would it be mucor mucor is a aseptate mold so this option is incorrect what kind of branching does it show obtuse angle or branching at 90 degrees rhizopus is again a mucorail and aseptate mold it shows what kind of branching again we know obtuse angle so again this is wrong acute angle branching hyphae pigmented hyphae with branching at 90 degrees mucor mucor is a non pigmented pigmented ones are the dematiaceous or the phioid molds names of which are very very different you know like the ones which cause chromoblastomycosis like you know rhinocladiella cladophyllophora phyllophora fonseca these are the pigmented hyphae so again this is wrong so our answer here is aspergillus we have a patient who has as endocarditis due to aspergillus just remember there are certain important risk factors for invasive aspergillosis most common cause of invasive aspergillosis is aspergillus fumigatus these include long term steroids and other immunomodulating agents then prolonged neutropenia often mentioned the questions immunosuppressive therapy for transplantation chronic granulomatous disease a very very important risk factors chronic granulomatous disease also other pathogens associated with cgd include staphylococcus aureus burkholderia cypacea serratia marsicans nocardia along with aspergillus these five pathogens are very important to be remembered with cgd then aids is a risk factors for invasive aspergillosis and invasive aspergillosis examples of these include invasive pulmonary aspergillosis invasive sinusitis tracheobronchitis 
cerebral aspergillosis, and it can also spread to bone, heart, skin, and other organs of the body. So as it had spread to the heart to cause endocarditis in our patient. And what is this picture telling us? That aspergillus loves to invade blood vessels. It is angio-invasive. Which are the two angio-invasive fungi that we know of? We know of aspergillus and which are the others? The mucorales, rhizopus, mucor, lichthemia, all these rhizomucor, these are all angio-invasive. That's why you have, it's a diagnosis of invasive disease due to either of these is an emergency. Otherwise, it can lead to high mortality. Next question, which of the following causes aplastic crisis in hereditary spherocytosis? This is a condition of chronic hemolytic anemia like thalassemia, sickle cell anemia. Generally, what is mentioned, the question is sickle cell anemia. Virus associated with sickle cell anemia. Here it has been changed to hereditary spherocytosis. What is your answer? Which virus can cause or rather in, cause uh, infect RBC's precursors? And the answer here is parvovirus. Okay. A plastic crisis in uh, hemolytic anemia patients, right? Parvovirus is our answer, which has an affinity for erythroid precursors like normoblasts and pronormoblasts. What is that receptor on these cells? The P blood group antigen. And once it infects these RBC precursors, it leads to their lysis, okay? So it is cytolytic in nature, cytotoxic. It lies, leads to the lysis, and that is responsible for that anemia seen in patients who are infected with or have a primary infection with parvovirus. Okay? Receptor is P blood group antigen. Let's quickly brush through the important syndromes associated with, with a primary infection with parvovirus. Primary infection. It's only seen with primary infection. One is when the infection occurs in a healthy child, it leads to erythema infectiosum, also called as Fifth disease. If a primary infection occurs in slightly older child, it can lead to papular, purpuric, gloves, and socks syndrome. Google search and you can see the picture out there. It leads to a uh, swelling of the palms and soles. Polyarthropathy, if the primary infection occurs in adults, mainly small joints are affected. In hemolytic anemia patients like thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, and so on, like in spherocytosis, aplastic crisis, and persistent anemia in immunodeficient like transplant recipients or in AIDS patients. And of course, in pregnancy, in, especially in the first half of pregnancy, parvovirus infection, primary infection can lead to fetal high drops. So the rates of transmission can be pretty high, as high as 30% and 5 to 10% of the infected fetuses can drop and develop hydrops fetalis. Our next question is a case of patient presented with symptoms of meningitis and the CSF sample was subjected to gram staining. The microscopy is shown below. So what do we see on microscopy? We are seeing these gram positive. Purple is meaning gram positive. Don't confuse it. Uh, don't be confused in your exam whether it is gram positive and gram negative. If it is appearing pink or magenta, that means it is gram negative. It, if it is purple or blue, that means it is gram positive. And we are seeing them as diplococci. Can you see the halo around these diplococci? That's the capsule. Your diagnosis this is pneumococcal meningitis pneumococcal meningitis which of the following features or tests will be characteristic of this organism when we think of pneumococci that means a streptococcus pneumonia all streptococci are catalase test negative keeping that in mind let's look for the options Oxidase and catalase negative does not ferment inulin. 
Well, let's leave this hanging. This could be our answer. Okay, hang on. Ferments glucose and maltose, but not inulin. Now, when we talk of pneumococcus, we are supposed to remember a few important characters that it has. One, it is alpha hemolytic. Apart from the usual things that we know, capsulated, gram-positive, diplococcus, then what else test do we remember about it? Bile-soluble, then bile-solubility test positive, then it is optogen sensitive, and then it ferments inulin. Inulin fermentation test is positive. These three are very important characters of strep, especially streptococcus pneumonia. Of course, it will be catalase negative, oxidase negative, like all streptococci, right? So keeping these important characters in our mind, let's look for our answer. Yes, it is catalase and oxidase negative, but it ferments inulin. This is wrong. It ferments glucose and maltose, but not inulin. This is again wrong. It is catalase and oxidase positive. This is straight away eliminated because all streptococci are catalase and oxidase negative. Option D says it is catalase negative, but and optogen sensitive. This is the answer that I like about streptococcus pneumonia. Are we clear? We are seeing these gram positive diplococci and it is catalase positive like all streptococci and it is optogen sensitive. Okay, so my answer is option D. Let's quickly go through the important things I just talked about streptococcus pneumonia. It's a gram positive diplococcus which is capsulated, which is loving carbon dioxide. It is a capnophile. It is catalase negative like all streptococci. So we have three C's associated here. It is bile soluble. Bile solubility test is positive. It is optogen sensitive and it is inulin fermentation test positive. And of course, it is alpha hemolytic streptococci. Can you name any other alpha hemolytic streptococcus? The ones which produce greening around their colonies, which is also called as partial hemolysis. That is the viridens group of streptococci. So if you are asked to differentiate the viridens group of streptococci from streptococcus pneumoniae, both of them are alpha hemolytic. We can use bile solubility. We can use optogen sensitivity. We can use inulin fermentation apart from the arrangement because pneumococcus is arranged as pairs whereas the viridens group of streptococci are arranged in chains right so those are the important characters of streptococcus pneumonia our last question a 45 year old man developed generalized muscle spasms with the arching of his back as shown in this image a few days after sustaining a puncture wound on his leg. So looking at this picture, what are we immediately going to remember? Opisthotonus characteristically seen in advanced tetanus. The toxin responsible for this abnormal posturing acts by which of the following? What is the name of this toxin? Tetanospasmin. And how does tetanospasmin act? It acts by preventing the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitters, GABA and glycine. And how does it do so? By proteolyzing a snare protein. What is that snare protein? Synaptobrevin, which is responsible for the docking of these neurotransmitters vesicles with the membrane, neuronal membrane, right? So let's read the options. Presynaptic inhibition of GABA and glycine release. This is absolutely correct. Presynaptic inhibition of acetylcholine receptor. Presynaptic, postsynaptic inhibition of GABA. This is incorrect. Cleavage of the snare proteins preventing acetylcholine release. This is the mechanism of action of 
botulinum toxin, not tetanospasmin, right? So our answer is option A, right? Opisthotonus, trismus, risa sardonicus, these are typical uh, words that we always relate with tetanus, right? Tetanus or lockjaw is mediated by the sole virulence factor tetanospasmin. When it is released, secreted by the bacterium, it is secreted as a protoxin having a molecular weight of about 1,50,000 daltons and it is immediately proteolized into two fragments which are still linked to each other by a single disulfide bond. The fragments are respectively called as the light chain or the A subunit, the active part, and the heavy chain or the B subunit, the binding part of the toxin. This toxin by retrograde axonal transport from the site of its released at the wound site, it is transported and it reaches the central nervous system, especially in the spinal cord and the brain stem. It proteolyzes synaptobrevin, preventing the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitters GABA and glycine. And that is responsible for an uncontrolled stimulation of the motor neurons and hence responsible for the characteristic spastic paralysis seen in tetanus. So this brings us to the end of the MCQs of microbiology, which was asked in the INICT July 2021 exam.